This is going to be a little strange, but I want you to put on the garments of the disciples for a moment. I want you to place around you the robe that maybe the disciple was wearing. Recently, Jesus has died on the cross. But also, he has risen from the grave. And it appears that he is alive, for he has shown up a couple more times. But yet, down deep inside as a disciple, you worry. There's a part of you that thought it would be different. You thought things was going to turn out different than the way it has. Some of your friends who are disciples are excited and they have all the faith, but then there's others, maybe you're one, that's not sure. Maybe you're carrying guilt this morning. Maybe you're carrying regret. Maybe you're wondering, where is Jesus? Where is God in my life now? What is going to happen? Today we are going to lean into John chapter 21 and we find the disciples on the side of a lake. And as they are there on the side of this lake, we find, we find that there's only seven of them. We know that there's 12 apostles. One was Judas. He betrayed Jesus. He went out and committed suicide. So there was only 11 left. But yet, here in this scene, we know that there are seven. And only seven. There's not any extra people around. There's no one in the background watching or listening. There's only seven disciples in John chapter 21. Jesus has risen from the grave. He told them in Matthew, we read, Jesus said, go tell my disciples to meet me in Galilee at the mountain that they will know about. And I'm sure they probably have already done that or they're about to do that because they are in the Galilean area. They're near the sea where Jesus did his ministry. But yet... As you have the garment of the disciples on, do you feel what they felt? Do you have questions? Do you worry? Is your life overwhelming? Are there things happening that you cannot find a solution for? The disciples felt that. So here they are, and we're going to begin reading in John chapter 21, verse 1. And it says... After these things, meaning Jesus has appeared to them in Jerusalem in chapter 20 a couple of times. After these things, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Now I want to stop just for a moment and I want to point something out that's very interesting about this verse. They are in Galilee. And in Galilee, there is a body of water that everything seems to center around. And what is the name of that that body of water usually? The Sea of Galilee. Why is John using Tiberias? Now, Tiberias is a city on the on the kind of the the west western south the southwestern area. If you've got a, a map in the back of your Bible, you might be able to look it up. But there, Tiberias is this headquarters of the Romans, and and it's a very Roman place. And why is John saying it's the Sea of Tiberias? I want you to know I have poured over commentaries, preachers, I have looked up articles, I have tried my best to bring you an answer today, and here's the answer. You ready? You you might want to write this down. Are you ready? Write it down. I don't know. (laughs) No one seems to have a good answer as to why John used Tiberius. There are speculations. Speculations that maybe they, they, have, they have moved themselves into a Roman mindset at this point. I don't agree with that. If I was to agree with an opinion, it would be maybe they are near Tiberias when this takes place. 
Maybe they're in the area of Tiberias, somewhere north or south or somewhere where it would be considered. This is the Sea of Tiberias. It's owned by the Romans. This area was the Tiberias section of the Sea of Galilee. That would be my opinion, but again, it's just my opinion. Maybe it's just telling us the location that they have come close to that. But again, you can write it down. The pastor does not know why it's Tiberias. But it's very curious to me that John would use the word. One day, I'm going to find out. I'm going to ask my dad when I get to heaven. Because heaven's sounding sweeter all the time to me. The older I get. Thank you, Dub. I'm going to ask him, why the Sea of Tiberias in chapter 21 of John? But we find here in verse 1 something very important for us to grab hold of to start this entire message from God. Today, you may be feeling confused. You may be feeling like life is more than you can handle. Some of the things that you had planned may not, may not be turning out. And some of the plans that you would like to have, you don't even know which way to go. I'm going to ask you to do a few things in just a few moments. So hold on with me. If there are difficulties in your life and you don't have answers for, hold on. I'm going to ask you to do something in just a few moments. Here's the very interesting thing. In chapter 21, verse 1, we are clearly told what the first part of this chapter is about. I want you to know that I spent a lot of time praying, reading, studying, and wrestling over this message, going, God, what in the world is the message in chapter 21 of John? And it finally hit me after more prayer. It's found in verse number 1. Look at this. We see this about Jesus, and you can write this down. Number 1, He reveals Himself. See that in verse 1? After these things, Jesus revealed Himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and He revealed Himself in this way. Now, very interesting, as you look down, verse 4, it says, The disciples did not know that it was Jesus. This whole section is about Jesus revealing himself to these seven men that he had spent three years with who find themselves wearing garments of despair, questions, confusion, not having any plans, not knowing what might be next. After these things, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Here we go. Simon Peter. Somebody say Peter. Peter. He is the head honcho. He's the leader. You're about to see how much he's a leader here. So Simon Peter, Thomas, who was called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, the two others of, and two others of his disciples were together. So we have the names of five. We don't have names of two of them. We don't know who those two were. Was it Matthew? We don't know. But we, we do know the names of five disciples and two, they don't have a name. So here they are together. These seven guys are somewhere and Peter speaks up. Look at this. I love this. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing, y'all. Gone fishing. There's a great song by Louis Armstrong. I would love to play at this moment. Where he sings, Gone fishing, yeah. There's a sign up on my door. And I know you wish I was playing it instead of trying to sing it. I can tell. But they, Peter's going, you know, I cannot sit here just like Peter, right? Peter's not a guy who could just sit on the front porch in a rocking chair and be content. Peter's a guy that's like, I need to be doing something. So he says, I'm going fishing. He doesn't even ask him, does he? He doesn't say, you want to come with me? What you guys want to do? He just says, I'm going fishing. Anybody here like to fish? See, I like to fish. My problem is the catching. I always have an issue catching. Oh, look at there. There's a fishing rod right over here to my right. Michael Cheeseman brought it today just for the sermon, apparently. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. He's gone fishing. You are listening to the sermon, right? You're not fishing while I'm... Oh, okay, just checking. But Simon Peter says to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to Peter, well, we're coming with you. We're not staying here. They went out and got into the boat. And that night... 
They caught nothing. It was typical that they would fish at night and catch fish so that in the morning they could take their fish to the market and make money so the fish would be sold fresh, sold fresh the next day to people who needed fish. And they were accustomed to fishing at night because they were fishermen. As Buddy read earlier in the book of Luke, they were out fishing whenever Jesus came by and said, follow me. They were fishermen. They knew about fishing. They knew about the Sea of Galilee or the Sea of Tiberias. They understood the smell of fish. But they had not had to fish in three years. And here they are. They're fishing. And they catch nothing. Verse 4, But when the day was now breaking, let me interpret that in Dahlonega, when it was morning, y'all, When the day was breaking, when it was morning, Jesus stood on the beach. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Seven men who had spent three years with this man did not know that it was Jesus standing on the beach. So Jesus said to them, this is a very interesting word to me. The first word here, and I hope you can see it in your translation, is the word children. It's the same word. If if you were to look at uh, pediatrics, and you looked at the Greek word, you'd understand where we get the word pediatrics from. It comes from the Greek word used here in this original text, meaning children. Pediatrics. He says, children, you do not have any fish to eat, do you? Now here is Jesus standing on the beach. They're out in a boat. They've been fishing all night. They've caught absolutely nothing. And this guy from the the shore says, Y'all don't have any fish, do you? Now I don't know about you, but I want you to just think for a moment. If you are a deer hunter and you have gone out to, to hunt deer all year long and it's the last day of hunting season and it's about time for you to go home and somebody comes by and says, you ain't got any deer, have you? Man, I just saw Chris Hunt drop his head like, but that would be the most, that's the worst of the worst right there. Here are these fishermen who, they fish. And they have nothing to show for it. All night long, all seven of them in a boat, nothing to show for it. Here's the other thing I want us to notice about Jesus. Not only does he reveal himself to these disciples, these seven, once again, but he also does this. He uses disappointment to reveal himself. Somebody needs to hear that. Jesus uses disappointment to reveal himself. Why does he do that? Because we get so caught up in me that we have to be brought to a place where we're looking for him. Where this stuff around us is not as important as it used to be. See, they had come to a place of disappointment. They had fished all night. They had zero fish. They didn't even have bait in their nets that night. If disappointment comes your way like it has in these disciples' life right here, because they answer in verse verse 5 with one word, no. There was no excuses offered. They just said, no, we don't have any fish. He says, do you have any fish to eat? Do you? You you don't have any, do you? And he said, they they all said, all seven of them apparently said, no. Disappointment will bring us to a place where we will listen to things we normally won't hear. Disappointment will bring us to a place where we will be aware of things we normally would not see. So here's what I want to tell you today. If you are in a place of disappointment, frustration, questions, if you're worried in your life what's coming next, let me tell you something. In that moment when you feel like you have no catch, hang on, don't give up. God's about to speak. Don't quit because Jesus Christ is nearby. They did not realize who that was, but he asked them a question, and even in that moment, they still had not realized who he was. They heard his voice. They had heard his voice before. They had seen him in Jerusalem, but yet here he is speaking, 
and they're not even sure who it is yet. This is so powerful for us because Galatians chapter 6, verse 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So I want to tell somebody today who may need to hear this. I think somebody does need to hear this. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't let off. Continue moving forward in faith. Continue doing what God told you last to do. If you don't know what to do next, if God hasn't revealed the next step, just keep doing what He's told you to do. Just keep faithful with that and keep going with that and trust Him to show you the next thing. And it may be in the moment of your greatest disappointment that He will begin to speak. You may not recognize Him at first, just like these disciples. Look, if you're wearing the garment of the disciples today and you're feeling that disappointment... You're not alone. They felt it. They're out there. They're in the middle of what they knew to do, and they caught no fish. I wonder if any of them looked over at Peter and said, Well, this was a great idea, Peter. No fish. I have no idea. The Bible doesn't tell us. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But they're at a point, the sun is coming up, no fish. And this man from the beach points it out that they have no fish. Thanks a lot. But let's lean into this story a little bit more. Listen, when you're not walking with Jesus, your work and your life will feel like a drab. It will feel like what's the use. When you're not walking step in step with Jesus, your job becomes overbearing. It's too much to handle. But when you're walking step in step with Jesus, you'll find out that Jesus has got a reason you you are right where you are. Whether it's in college, whether it's at work, whether it's even having to deal with a boss that is a pain in the rear. He has you there for a reason. And if you can walk step in step with Jesus, cry out every morning, Lord Jesus, don't let me slap him today. Let me love him. Then you're going to find your life will be filled with more joy. But when you're not walking step in step with Jesus and it's always about other people, you're going to live a life of disappointment and drab. Luke chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Buddy read that earlier and I want to bring your attention back to that because we're about to read something that's very interesting in the comparison. Now in Luke chapter 2, we find that these disciples are encountering Jesus as Jesus is about to teach. And he, is, he gets in the boat and he pushes away and, and they are teaching, or Jesus is teaching. They had fished and they were putting up their stuff. Luke chapter 5, it is Luke 5, right? I think I wrote it down wrong. It sure ain't Luke 2. That's when Jesus was born. Luke Luke chapter 5. All right. When Jesus is done speaking to the people on the bank after he's used Peter's boat as as a place to stand... Verse 4 of chapter 5 of Luke, it says, Now when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon Peter, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon Peter responded, the fisherman, and he said, Master, we worked hard all night. Does that sound familiar? And caught nothing. But I will do as you say, and I'll let down the nets. Now when you go back to John chapter 21, we find that after they say no, and this man who's standing on the beach says to them a hundred yards away, a hundred yards is the length of a football field. Now imagine standing at the end zone on one end and somebody being at the end zone on the other and you're carrying on a conversation. It's got to be loud, but understand this is also morning time. It's quiet. There's probably not a lot of a lot of noise in this area. And Jesus says, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat and you will find the fish. Now, how can anybody standing on the beach be able to tell somebody in a boat where the fish are? There's only one. You want to talk about a fish finder? Bass Pro Shop has never had a fish finder as good as Jesus. Jesus knew exactly where to tell him to cast, cast the net because he created those fish. He knew how the fish thought, thought. He knew how they moved. And he had those fish get on the right-hand side of that boat. 
And Jesus says, cast the net on the right hand side of the boat. So it goes on in chapter 21. So they cast it, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great quantity of fish. Going back to Luke chapter 5, we will see that Simon Peter responded, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing, but I will do as you say, and I'll, we will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they caught a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to tear. Now, here's the cool thing. Jesus took them to a place of disappointment, so in that moment they could remember and see that had to be Jesus. Because look at what happened in chapter 21. Here is Jesus revealing himself, because remember, they don't know who he is. So they cast it out and they get this great quantity of fish, verse 7. Therefore, that disciple who Jesus loved, which we all know is who? John. John. He likes to bring this out. He likes to let you know that he's faster than Peter, and he's loved more than Peter. Therefore, that disciple who Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord! He's done this before. That's Jesus! And Peter, we read here, he says, So when Peter heard that, he didn't realize it. He had John tell him. And when John told him, Listen, maybe you need somebody to tell you that Jesus is working in your life. So let me be John in your life today. Jesus is doing something. Jesus is doing something. Be on the lookout. It doesn't matter where you are physically, mentally, emotionally, financially. It does not matter where you are. Jesus is doing something in your life. Let me be a John in your life. There's Jesus. He's working. Peter gets excited. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for, for he had taken it off to do his work. He was dressed for fishing. He was relaxing. And there's a very curious word in the New American Standard. Maybe you got something different, but it doesn't say that he jumped in the water. It doesn't say that he dove into the water. The New American uses the word, he threw himself into the water. You know what that means? That guy did not come over to the edge of the boat and just start, okay, I'm coming, Jesus. Oh, no. He grabbed his garment, put that on, and he was just out of that thing. He probably tripped going over the side, just threw himself in the water. He's going, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. Everybody else stayed in the boat because they had to deal with the fish. <laughs> Verse 8, but the other disciples came in the little boat. This is not a big boat. Now remember what happened before. There were two boats and those things were beginning to sink. There were so many fish. They're trying to bring in a haul of fish. And so here is Jesus. He's on the shore. Peter recognizes it. John recognizes him. Oh my goodness, this is getting good. But the other disciples came in the little boat for they were not far from the land, about 200 cubits away or 100 yards, dragging the net full of fish, dragging the net full of fish. All night long they had been fishing and had nothing. But in one moment, Jesus does something and reveals himself. Wow. That's the third thing. There's a third thing that I want us to grab hold of here in just a second. He reveals his will. He revealed himself. He used disappointment to do it, and he revealed his will. Remember, we just read, Jesus said, cast your net on the right side of the boat. Do you know how far it was to success? The width of the boat. How far away was obedience? The width of the boat. How far away was a blessing like they'd never thought of? The width of the boat. If they had said, nope, not going to do it. We're the fishermen. You're not. God, I'm doing it my way, not your way. They never would have had a net full of fish. They never would have recognized that as Jesus because that would have been rebellion. But yet, the width of the boat, they took that net, threw it on the right side, had all these fish. They're bringing them to the, to the shore. He revealed his will in verse 6, and he does it in verse 10. Let's start in 9. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already made and fish placed on it and bread. Now, where did Jesus get that fish? Where did he get the bread? And I have another question. Where did he get the fire? I mean, did he have it in his pocket? Did he go fishing that night and catch a fish? Or did he just say, get over there on the fire? 
I don't know. But there is Jesus on the shore, and don't miss this fact. It's not just a fire. How many men I got in the room? Oh, okay, ar, 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 ar. How many of you just love to cook, like grill out or get a fire going? Come on, go ar, 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 ar with me. Yeah. Now, to get a fire with charcoal, it doesn't happen like that, does it? It takes time. And the best fire to cook on is the one with charcoals. You have to let that thing burn, and you've got to feed it with fuel until that thing gets to where it's got some charcoals to cook. And then it's got to cook. How in the world could they not smell the fish cooking on the shore? But it says they get there and they realize he's got charcoal fish and bread. Now, can I just give you the Sunday school answer? Because I don't know. Again, I don't know where he got all of it, but he is Jesus. So we're going to give him that card. So these disciples, they get out, on verse 9, they see a charcoal fire already made and fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Bring some of the fish that you have now caught. Now, these disciples, these seven men could have said, No, those look good. Let's just eat those. But no, they responded. Jesus, Jesus gave them a step, the next will that they needed to, to follow. What has God told you to do? And you're not taking the step. What has God said to you and you have given excuses and you've delayed responding? I'm here to tell you today, do not delay. When Jesus tells you to do something, respond. This is, this is really cool. By the way, I'm about to show some, something to you. All right. This is so cool. Jesus says, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Now remember, they're trying to get this this net of fish to the shore. It's six other guys in a small boat, right? And it said that they were struggling to get it in. So, look at verse 11. So Simon Peter went up and hauled the net to land full of large fish. 153 large fish. And altogether, there were so many... But yet the net was not torn. Remember earlier the net was tearing. This, this net's not tearing. It's got 153 fish. Now I want somebody. I know somebody's on their phone right now. So just go ahead and pull up your calculator. I want to hear from you how much these fish weighed. It says that they're large fish, right? Come on, somebody's doing it. I see it. All right, large fish. So let's just guess. These fish may be three, four pounds. That's conservative, right? For a large fish, three pounds. What do you think, Richard? Three to five. Three to five. Let's, let's say three. Let's go on the conservative side. So let's go three times how many fish? 153. Somebody tell me what three times 153 is. For what? 459 pounds? You're telling me that Peter went out there by himself, grabbed a net that weighed 459 pounds, and drug it on land by himself? Dude, Peter was yoked. I'm talking, that dude had some, some, some muscle. You want to be somebody? You be like Peter if you want to be strong. But he's not even that strong. And he's strong, I'm telling you. He's, but he can't do that. 459 pounds. You can't tell me that Peter was this little rinky dink guy wearing a, wearing a robe and he was just this little... No, that dude was like Richard Bailey back there. <laughs> if, I had, if I had a net full of 153 fish I needed to pull in, I guarantee you I'm not even going to try. I'm calling Richard. Richard and Buddy, would you go get the fish and get it on shore? But look at Peter here. Peter, Peter goes and gets it. The disciples had tried. They had done the best they could to get it as close as they possibly could. But here comes Peter to finish the job the rest of the way. If you'll simply listen to what Jesus says and obey Him, then He's got blessings for you you've never thought possible. You may have questions. You may be disappointed. You may be wondering, what do I do next? But if you'll just trust and you'll do whatever He tells you, you're going to find great blessings. Verse 12, Jesus said to them, Come. And have breakfast. Here's, here's what I love about this. He reveals His love. He reveals His love. In verse 9, when they get there, there's already a charcoal fire, fish, and bread. Already ready. Appetizer. 
time for breakfast. Then we see in verse 10, he says, bring some more fish. I'm here. I want you and me to sit down. And then in verse 12, he says, come and have breakfast. Ladies and gentlemen, that's love. He not only stretched out his hands and died on a cross for us, he loves us in the life that we're living right now. He wants to commune with you. Jesus is saying, come and have breakfast with me. How many of us skip breakfast? Oh, hold on, I'm going there. How many of us skip breakfast with Jesus because we're just too busy? Jesus will just have to catch up with us during the day because I just don't have time for Jesus this morning. Jesus has already got a bountiful blessing for you awaiting. If you'll stop long enough to listen to him say, come and have breakfast. Verse 12, none of the disciples ventured to inquire of him, who are you? Because, look at this, knowing that it was the Lord. See this whole thing about revealing himself? He revealed himself through disappointment. They obeyed his will. They did what he asked. And they all seven understand, this is Jesus. Could it be that you've got questions about God working in your life because you're not listening and obeying to what he's already telling you? These seven were living in disappointment and despair, but yet they had hope and Jesus showed up. Verse 13, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. It wasn't a buffet. Jesus took the bread and he took the fish and he gave it to them. And you know what they saw as soon as he handed it to them? When he took that bread and he said, here you go, Peter. Here you go, John. Here you go, James. Those seven disciples as they reached out to take that fish and that bread, saw the nail-scarred hands that were pierced for them. Can you imagine the moment and the reality of that digging deep into their soul? Here is Jesus, the one who died for me, now feeding me on a morning when I was hungry, when I didn't know what to do. Jesus took the bread and he gave it to them And the fish likewise. There were 5,000 people who were hungry. And he took the bread and the fish. And he blessed it. And he broke it and he passed it out to the disciples. He said, take this and give to the people. But this time, Jesus said, let me feed you personally. These seven men that were dear to him. And it says in verse 14, This was now the third time that Jesus revealed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now we know that Jesus, he reveals himself, he uses disappointment, he reveals his will to us, what the next step is for us. He reveals his love. Luke 5, 8, he says, uh, Peter responds to Jesus the first time he encounters him. And Peter says, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinner. But in this encounter, Peter throws himself into the water and runs to Jesus. The time he had spent with Jesus had changed his life. Only one person, imagine this, this is good, somebody's going to want to write this down, because I wrote it down. There was only one person on shore that day that was wet from head to toe. And that was Peter. The rest of them were in a boat, They may have gotten wet when they got out, but Peter, he was all in. He was the only wet one on that beach that day. But that wet clothing and all that he had on did not keep him from obeying God, obeying Jesus' command, and going and taking 400, was it 59 pounds, roughly, and dragging it to shore. I want us to know this today. This is what I want us to walk away with. Because this is a truth that you really need to hold on to. Jesus will reveal himself and his will to you and to me and to us. 
He will reveal Himself and His will to us. You may be wondering, well, I don't know what God's will is. Have faith, don't give up, just keep moving forward in what He's told you to do. And He will reveal more to you when you're faithful with with what He tells you. Why would He tell you the next step if you ain't doing what He's already told you? If you will not obey Him now, why, why can He trust you to take the next step in obedience? You have to do what He's asked you to do now and trust Him. Success is measured in obedience, not the outcome of what you do. It may turn out that you don't catch any fish, but you do what God asks you to do, what Christ bids you to do. There's something very interesting about meals during this time, and I wanted to mention this. Eating a meal with someone was a sign of fellowship and intimate, close relationships. Here is Jesus. He had already prepared a meal for them. And they're coming and they're sitting down. You know what else a meal was used for? A sign of forgiveness. A sign of acceptance. Whenever there were parties that had a dispute, they would oftentimes, at the end of reconciliation, sit down and have a meal together to say, fellowship has been restored. Peter is the one who said, well, I know who you are. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. While Peter, Peter said that he was the first one to speak up and say, Jesus, they are, every one of them, other people may desert you. I won't. I'll die with you, Jesus. That same Peter also said on that same night, I don't know him, three times. That same Peter is not mentioned of being near the cross when he was crucified. That same Peter was not there to help bury Jesus in the tomb. But yet Peter is here and Jesus is extending his hands to feed them and extending his hands of forgiveness. That's why when you read on and Jesus says, Do you agape me? Do you love me more than these? Do you you love me regardless of the circumstances and the situation? Is it an unconditional love for me, Peter? Peter responds with the only human side that he could. He was just honest. He said, Well, Jesus, I phileo you. I'm fond of you. I have affection for you because I love you. But agape is not the word he used in response to Jesus. That agape love was extended by Christ, the Son of the living God. God himself extends agape love to each of us. We may be disappointed in ourselves. We may have messed up. We may have, we may have regret. But I'm here to tell you right now, That Jesus wants to reveal himself to you and reveal his will and you've not been disqualified because you've messed up. You're disqualified because you will not turn to him and ask for his forgiveness. That will disqualify you. So the difference between success and failure was the width of a boat that day. As they wore their garments, they could have said, nope, we're not going to do what this man says on the beach, or we are going to do what this man says on the beach. And when they did, blessings came. A catch like they never thought possible. But more importantly, we don't see the fish as the main point in this scripture. What we see is that relationship with Jesus. Jesus revealed himself. He wants to reveal himself to you. On that morning, the disciples, as they wore their garments, in this moment, as we read it, they could smell the smoke as it permeated their nose. They could hear the softness of maybe the breeze in the morning and the warmth of the sun just as it comes up and caresses their skin. As the disciples sat there with their garments on, maybe they... They could hear the chirps of small birds. But they also could feel a weight of guilt. A weight of regret and disappointment within them. Because they were not the one that helped Jesus carry his cross. They were not the ones that put him in the tomb. They were the ones that ran the other way when things got tough. 
Yet Jesus was here fixing them breakfast. Here they were with an idea of what this Messiah would look like and what it would mean for their future. But yet, all that they had dreamed of was shattered. And there sat Jesus, loving them, feeding them, forgiving them. He wants to do the same for you today. No matter what scars you have, no matter how bad of a track record you might have, or how much guilt that you carry, your inconsistency, your lust, your impatience, your worry, the things that you are stealing, all that can be forgiven by Jesus. Jesus says here, I think these are some of the most beautiful words In verse 12, Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Jesus is extending an invitation to someone today. Come and have breakfast. All that you think that's keeping you from me, I died on the cross for. So today, what do we do with this? Well, the first thing we need to do is do as it says in Mark Chapter 1, it recaps the same story that was read in Luke chapter 5. In in Mark chapter 1, Jesus said to Simon and Andrew by the sea when they were fishermen, fishing for fish, Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. First thing we need to do is follow Jesus. Not our emotions, not the culture. Not what seems to be accepted around us, but let's follow Jesus. What He has said, what He is doing. Follow Jesus. Say that with me. Follow Jesus. Jesus said, follow me and I will will have you become fishers of men, of people. They fished fish for a living, but they fished people to build the kingdom of God. And it says in Mark, I love the way Mark writes, I've shared this with you before. Verse 18, it says, Immediately they left their nets and followed Him. They followed Jesus. So we need to follow Jesus. second thing is, make His will my top priority. But pastor, i got bills to pay. You think Jesus don't know that? Pastor, i got to take care of my family. You think Jesus is not aware of your family? I hate to break it to you. Jesus loves your spouse more than you've ever loved your spouse. Jesus loves your children more than you will ever love your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, your great-great-grandkids. Jesus will love them more than you ever will. Make His will your top, top priority. Let Him take care of the things that you cannot take care of. The third thing is this. If you make His will your top priority, you know what the response to that is? Obey. Obey His will. Today, as we put on the garments of the disciples and we tried to step into their their shoes on the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, this place that they grew up, with the smell of fish, with the movement of the water as it lapped lazily against the shore. We find ourselves understanding. Because even today in 2024, we can be disappointed, we can be overwhelmed, we can have questions, we can be unsure. And if that is you today, here's where the action comes in. Trust Christ more than you See your problems. Turn your life over to Him. Totally let His priority be number one. Here's your seven-day challenge. Sometime over this next week, I'm just asking you to ask one person, what has God revealed to you lately? That's going to make some of you uncomfortable to ask. Some of you are going to be uncomfortable if you are asked that. Either way, that's why it's called a seven-day challenge. It's not seven-day easy way. It's a seven-day challenge. Ask someone this week, 
What has God revealed to you lately? You know what that means? You need to have an answer, which means that you're going to be going, God, uh, show me something, which means you're going to be looking, and you're going to be aware of something going on, and you're going to be doing it with someone else, which is absolutely perfect. Today we come from many generations, from many walks of life, from many stages with lots of different things going on. Some of us, life is not too bad right now. Others, not so good. And everything in between. But I can tell you this. Jesus loves you and He wants to show you. He wants to show you what His will is, but He's not going to beat you over the head and treat you like a puppet. He's simply going to say, I'm here and I love you. And if you will listen to my will and take the next step of obedience of what I've asked you to do, then I'm going to bless you and I'm going to show you more stuff about me. You want to know more about Jesus? Obey Him. Follow Him. Seek after Him. Make His will a priority in your life. These disciples did just that and it changed their life because they got to have breakfast with Jesus. We pray with me? Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love and your compassion that you would show to us the love that you have. That you would reveal yourself to us. We do not have to walk around wondering if there is a God and if God does exist, what is he like? Because you loved us so much, you revealed yourself in what we call the scriptures, the Holy Bible, so that we can see who you are and try to comprehend the best we can as individuals and people, humans, in this world that confines us to time and space. But God, you are beyond time and space. You have created all things. May we lean into that and trust in that and know that you are God. And you want to reveal yourself to us, and you want to reveal to us what your will is for us, and we just need to step in faith and watch you say in the next thing, and then just trust in you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. That he would go through so much so that we could understand and know that you love us. Lord, if someone is here, if someone is listening that does not have a relationship with Jesus, that they don't have that intimate sit down with me and have breakfast relationship where they're connected to you through Christ, I pray right now that they'll ask you to forgive them and take over their life. Lord, right now, they don't have to wait. They don't have to say some kind of special prayer. They don't have to repeat after me. They just simply ask you to forgive them and ask you to take over their life. Now that person is a changed individual. And for those who know you, God, and have gotten caught up in despair, despondency. They revel in the questions. I pray that you will reveal yourself in a way that they will know what to do next. God, forgive us where we have fallen short. In Jesus' name.